SMU, and this is joint work with my student, Anshul Gandhi, who's really amazing. And we work very closely also with Intel Research Labs, which is in Pittsburgh. And so we work with Mike Kozich at Intel, and he's also really great. And I'm actually a queuing theorist. Um, I do stochastic modeling of computer systems, but I, as Yale say, I cross the layers. And so I've become interested in power management of data centers, and so that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Okay, so we all know power is expensive, and here are some quotes that came from energystar.gov. So these are looking at the annual U.S. data center energy consumption, and the numbers that I saw were 100 billion kilowatt hours. This is every single year in the U.S., or $7.4 billion, okay? Another way that this is stated is 3% of the overall U.S. energy energy production, or the electricity for 9 million homes, or as much carbon dioxide as all of Argentina. So these are all quotes that came from one website. And all of these numbers are expected to double in the next five years. But what's most disappointing to me is that most of this power is actually being wasted. Okay, so it's not going to any use. So if you look at data centers today, the servers are only busy 5 to 30% of the time. But the servers are left idle, and when they're left idle, they're consuming almost full power, okay? Like 60 to 70% of the power. Now this is a quote from my friends at Google, but the latest Gartner report had the same figures. They said 18% utilization, despite all the virtualization that's been going on, the data centers are still only at 18% utilization, which is pretty horrible. So why is this so bad? Well, a busy server, and I'm talking about the servers that we use in our labs. So we have a lab of servers, and we use these Intel Xeon servers, because we got them from Intel, okay? And the busy server is consuming 200 watts. But an idle server in our lab is still burning power at a rate of 140 watts, okay? So it seems that the solution should be simple. Now, um, maybe I'll tell a story at this point. I'm watching my parents here. So when I was growing up, um, everybody spoke in English in my house because, I don't know, that was the thing. We were all supposed to be speaking English and learning English. But whenever my mom got angry at me, she would scream in Hebrew. It was just the natural thing she couldn't help herself. So she would suddenly convert to Hebrew. And one of the things, so the Hebrew I know is only from yelling. And uh, <laughs> it's very little Hebrew. But one of the things was, um, <laughs> Okay, which is um, turn off the lights, you're wasting energy, okay? So the obvious solution here is, well, turn the server off. You're not using it, so turn it off, okay? But that isn't so easy, because when it comes to servers, there's a huge setup time to get the server back on. In fact, in our lab, it's 260 seconds. And during that whole time, power is being burned at maximum rate, 200 watts, which is pretty disturbing. Okay, it makes you wonder, should you really turn the server off? Now, these numbers might seem high to you, but I've talked to companies, and every time I talk to Facebook or HP or any of these companies, they tell me the numbers are actually higher than this for turning the servers off, because they have software updates that have to come up when the server comes back on again. And they're also terrified, like really terrified, that if they turn the server off, it might never come back to life. Okay, <laughs> so they're really scared. And so what I want to talk about in this talk is should we turn the servers off? Okay, it's a very simple talk. Should we turn them off? So what do companies do right now? Why are we wasting power, okay? So the industry standard is called provisioning for the peak. That's what I would call it. So you have load that's coming in, and maybe you don't know what that load is. You don't know when it's gonna be high or low. Maybe you have some idea, but in this talk, I'm gonna assume you know nothing, okay? And so, you try to estimate where that peak is. Usually you overestimate it. So at Facebook they're telling you that they overestimate it just to be extra careful. And then you turn all the servers on. I don't know if you can see this yellow line, but it's at the peak. You turn on as many servers as you need to satisfy that peak and meet some kind of response time guarantee. That's what you try to do, okay? And of course this is wasteful, okay? So throughout the talk I'm gonna assume you don't know the load and this is the always on policy where you basically leave the servers on all the time. That's what we're gonna be comparing with. So there's an obvious performance trade-off that we need to talk about, and that has to do with response time, which I'm gonna call T, and power, which 
which I call P. Okay, so if you use a policy like always on, where you leave the servers on, it's fantastic for response time because the servers are on and you can meet your response time goals, okay? But it's wasteful of power because sometimes the load is low. On the other hand, if you turn the servers off, this really hurts response time because sometimes the servers aren't available to you when you need them. On the other hand, it could save power, but it's not even so obvious because, you know, with a setup overhead, burning power when you're setting up, it's not even so obvious that it saves power, so I say it might save power. And we'd like to understand how these compare, okay? And what I'm talking about is called dynamic capacity provisioning. Dynamic capacity provisioning is this on-off, you know, turning servers on and off. All right, so the key here, oh, I've lost it. you don't want to be shutting servers on and off. So let me see if I can make this work. Let's try one more time. Ah, oh, we got it back. Okay, good. All right, so the outline of my talk is I'm gonna start with theory because that's where I come from. And when I explain theory, I'm gonna explain a very simplified version of on off, okay? It's not gonna be right, okay? It's not gonna be realistic. My models aren't gonna be realistic, my policies aren't gonna be realistic, and my metrics aren't gonna be realistic. But that's okay because we're in theory land and there's a benefit to the theory. And the benefit of the theory is that it allows you to understand the effect of scale and looking at very large data centers. So when YY was talking, she was saying she didn't want to work in these power management of data centers because we don't have very big data centers as academics. But with theory, you can examine any size data center you want. And then after that, I promise I'll move to implementation where I'll have real workloads and real data data centers and we're actually implementing everything and we turn the servers on and off and you'll get to watch it happen. Okay, so queuing theory 101. All right, so here is what we call an MMK. So for those of you not familiar, this is a, a theoretical model. The idea is the jobs come in, they're coming in over there. Let's see if that works over here, okay? These are the jobs that are coming in and they're coming into a single queue. And then there are the K servers over here. And whenever a server is free, it grabs a job from the head of the queue. And it works on that job. That's what it does. When a server is free, it grabs a job. A server in this model only works on one job at a time. I know this is unrealistic, but this is, this is the models that we use. Servers work on one job at a time, okay? They grab the job, all right, to work on. And um, within this MMK, there's usually an arrival rate, some average arrival rate, which we're gonna denote by lambda. So imagine like three jobs per second coming in to this queue, to this K server queue. And then there's some average job size, S average, which say, let's imagine that's like 10, job, 10 seconds. So three jobs per second are coming in, and each job on average, say, takes 10 seconds. I mean, these are just numbers just to play with, okay? So how many units of work are coming in per second? Well, three times 10, 30 units of work are coming in each second. So the utilization, which we call rho, is this lambda times the average job size divided by k. So imagine there's 30 units of work coming in per second. If you had 30 servers, that would be a utilization of one. But if you have 100 servers, that's a utilization of 30%, okay? So throughout this talk, I'm going to hold the utilization, well, throughout the theory part, I'm gonna fix the utilization. The utilization is the fraction of time a server is busy. So I'm gonna fix this utilization at 30%, okay? Because I wanna make it seem like the data centers that we have. It's actually even lower, so it makes my case better. But I'm gonna fix it at 30%. Imagine we could get to 30%. I'm gonna hold it there, and I'm gonna look at the effect of the parameters, okay? And what I'm gonna ask is which is better? Always on, always on just keeps the case servers on. You leave them on all the time, nice thing to do. Or on off. On off says whenever a server is free in this, in this picture, whenever it looks into the queue and there's nobody there, so it can't do anything, okay, then it just shuts itself off. 
It says, I'm done. And it shuts itself off. And when a new job comes in, it waits in the queue. It has to wait for a server to turn on. So it has to wait for a setup time. And our setup time is 260 seconds. So it has to wait 260 seconds for a server to turn on. But if somebody else turns on first, if some other server is available first, then it can use that server. Okay, so that's how on off works. And within this kind of a model, we ask which of these has the highest performance per watt? Now performance per watt is a systems metric that I've seen in a lot of papers. This is the average response time here. This is the average response time. And this is the average power. And what you want to do is you want to minimize both the average response time and the average power, which is the same as maximizing the reciprocal. So maximizing the performance per watt. That's what we're trying to do. Okay, so here's the picture again. And the point that I'm making there with that citation is to analyze this in theory is not an easy situation, okay? So many people like um, Uri sitting over here have worked on servers with setup times, okay? Setup times are the setup cost of, you know, 260 seconds. But the work on servers with setup times has been done for a single server, okay? What we did was um, in this thing in 2010, we were the first to look at multi-server systems with setup times, which has been an open problem for about 50 years. And we finally were able to make progress on it. And that, that progress allows me to show you some actual results on how these kinds of problems scale. So if you look over there, the first chart over here, maybe I'll walk over here. This is dealing with 10 servers. So here's the case of 10 servers. And on this axis, you see setup time. And on this axis, you see the job size. Now, the pink dots are saying always on is better. And the green dots are saying on off is better. Look who's better. Always on, OK? As the setup time increases, always on is, you know, as you have more and more setup time, always on is looking better and better, which makes sense. As the job size gets bigger, you have these bigger and bigger jobs, but you have a fixed utilization. And because you have a fixed utilization and bigger and bigger jobs, the time between jobs is getting bigger and bigger, the interarrival time. And so when you have big interarrival times, on off starts to look good. But what's interesting about this picture is that even with 10 servers and a, a relatively low utilization, like 30%, on off does not look very good, okay? If for those of you who are familiar with like the power nap paper and stuff like that, that was with one server, okay? And the reason the numbers look good is because their setup time was insanely low, okay? But in my servers, I'm telling you, the setup time is 260 seconds, believe me, we're in the red, okay? It's not looking so good. So let's look what happens when we have 50 servers. Well, with 50 servers, it's a whole different story. With 50 servers, on off is starting to look a lot better. With 100 servers, almost the whole world says on off, okay? And believe me, by the time you get to 300, I can't show you any red dots, okay? It's all green, okay? So what's going on here? As you have more servers, okay, when a job comes in, okay, it's still 30% utilization, but because there are more servers, it's more likely that one of them will free up soon. Even though the utilization is held constant at 30%, one of them will be available more quickly. And so as you have more servers, on off becomes a better thing to do. Now, I'm going to leave the theory world now, okay? This is it for theory. The only message I wanted you to get was when data centers get big, okay, which they are, they are big already. We just don't see it in our lab. But for the big data centers, turning servers off makes sense. And we can prove it theoretically that it makes sense to turn them off, even when the setup cost is very, very high. No matter what it is, you can get to a big enough data center where it makes sense to do this. Okay, so now let's look practically, because you might not believe any of this, okay? Because that's, that's a nice theory of it, but let's look at the practical system. So in this practical system, I'm going to assume no longer a Poisson process, no longer exponential jobs, none of that. It's all going away. There's some unknown arrivals, okay, some arrival stream. 
The load changes over time. It goes up, it goes down. We don't know what's coming, and we have to be able to respond to it. So here's a picture of our data center. What we're doing in our data center is we've tried to mimic Facebook as much as possible. We wanted to do Facebook because we wanted a combination of CPU and I.O. Okay? So here's the traffic coming in. This is the unknown traffic. And it comes into a load balancer or some front end router. And then these are the 28 application servers that are in our lab. These are 28 application servers. And when the traffic comes in, so you have hundreds of requests coming in per second. Hundreds of requests are coming in. And when they come in to this router, there's no queue, there's no central queue. Okay, forget all the theory stuff. They're immediately dispatched to the application servers. So each of these servers is basically time sharing. It's doing processor sharing among many requests at a time. Okay, so it's handling many requests. Now, there's also a memcached layer, just like in Facebook, and a database. And these are all connected, okay? And the memcache stores stuff in the database. The workload is a key value workload. So let me explain that. So what happens here, let's try this. Okay, so what happens is the work comes in here, these requests are immediately dispatched to here. Now each request is a request for a page, like a page in Facebook, okay, somebody's page. That request is a key. The key gets looked up here in the memcache, okay? Gets looked up here, and what's returned is the value, okay, which is the page, but also the value consists of more keys, like the friends of the person, okay? So for us, on average, each key converts into three, into a value, and that value is three more keys, on average. We have a lot of variability in what you get back. And then those values have to be looked up, because those are keys now, that have to be looked up again, and again, each key becomes three values. And this goes back and forth, back and forth, with each key becoming three values. Um, so in the end, a single request is really, this happens eight times, a single request is like three to the eight key value, um, key value lookups. So a single request is huge, okay? It only takes about 100 milliseconds, but it's a big deal, okay? It's going back and forth between um, the application servers and the memcache. And remember, there are hundreds of requests coming in per second into the system. Our database here holds a billion key value pairs. And they're, they're used to populate the memcache, which is being looked up. So this is a real running system. I know it's not the size of Facebook, but we're trying to make it look like Facebook, okay? And one of the things is you'll notice there are more application servers than there are memcache servers, and that's typical in Facebook. And Facebook's actually eight times more application servers than memcache servers. Um, but we don't do, whoops. We don't do as much, um, as much CPU. The green stuff, notice that I've painted some stuff green. All of our power management is gonna be done in the application layer, not in the memcache. The application layer is easy because it's, anybody? Stateless. stateless, of course, thank you. Okay, it's stateless, so it's easier to turn the servers on and off, okay? We're not gonna touch the memcache, although I understand some people at Technion are touching the memcache, so I wanna hear about it. Okay, but we're not touching it. All right, metrics. So the metrics we're gonna be looking at are the 95 percentile of response time, as well as the average response time, okay? But of course, also the average power. Typically, what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to meet a 95 percentile guarantee for response time while minimizing power, okay? So we meet the guarantee and minimize the power. So let me explain the policies in terms of this. So I'm gonna explain what I mean by turning servers off now, very soon. So let's consider a single server. So this is a single time sharing server, like one of those application servers. And these dots over here represent our measurements. So this is the 95 percentile of response time as a function of arrival rate. And what you see here is suppose we wanna meet a goal of 400 milliseconds, it's a little bit cut off, a goal of 400 milliseconds for response time, suppose we want to make that goal, then we can afford to stuff only 60 requests per second into a server. So suppose our goal is like between four and 500 milliseconds, this was our response time goal. Basically it tells us you can only put 60 requests per second in a server or the server can't meet that goal. So now the way capacity provisioning works 
is suppose you have some total request rate into the whole data center. So you have a request rate of 300 requests per second. And you know each server can only handle 50 requests per second, sorry, 60 requests per second. So you know that you need five servers. Okay, so you take the total request rate into the, into the data center, divide it by that 60, that's the number of servers you need. So what always on does is it says, well, let me take the maximum request rate, okay? Let me take the max request rate and divide that by 60, and that's how many servers I need, and I will always keep those on. What on off does instead is it says, let me look at the request rate at the moment, let me try to estimate what the request rate is at the moment, because I have to estimate it, because I'm running this thing in real time. Let me estimate it, let me divide that by 60, that's the number of servers that I need now, at this moment. If I had more servers on than that number, then I need to start marking some to be shut off. Now remember, each of these servers is running many requests, so I can't just shut it off. I have to wait for the request to clear, and then it can go off, okay? But, and, but if for some reason I estimate that I need more servers than I have now, then I need to set, start setting those up but those servers aren't available to me yet, so all my requests that are coming in get load balanced among the servers I have until I have more servers. So I always load balance among the servers that I have. So that's on off. Are there questions? Okay, on off is very standard. This is the standard idea for how to turn servers off. And you basically want to always be estimating how many servers you need at all moments in time, okay, and adjusting to the load and then you leave that many on. Okay, so here's some actual results, some numbers. So this is a trace, okay, this is a real trace, and what I'm showing here is always on. And always on, you can see, this is the curve, this is the load, and what always on does is it finds that peak, and it says, well, in order to meet the 95 percentile for the peak, I need 14 servers, okay? So my arrival rate here was 14 times 60 requests per second, and that's why I need 14 servers to have on. And it leaves those servers on, and that's wonderful for response time. We have a 291 millisecond response time for the, for the 95 percentile of response time, which is great, but the average power is very high, 2,300 watts, okay, a lot of power. So by contrast, we tried implementing on-off. And we thought this was gonna work very well. Okay, I thought this was gonna be a short story. We implemented on-off, and let me explain what's going on here. So the blue dots are the servers that we actually have on, and the red, the red X's are the servers we're trying to turn on. Okay, these are the servers that are being set up. And so what happens in on-off, which is very interesting, is we get this important information that we need to turn servers on. We need to turn them on because the load is going up. So we start setting up servers to turn them on. But just as we turn on all these servers, we get this reactive information saying, wait, the load just went down. So we're like, oh, we've got to turn the servers off. So we turn the servers off. And then, uh-oh, the load's going back up again. So oh, we've got to turn the servers on. You see the X's are following the curve perfectly. The X's are exactly following the curve for what we need to do. But we, get, we start to turn those servers on, but no, we get this information that the servers need to go off, so we turn the servers off, okay? And this is this crazy thing that goes on with on off, okay? The servers are never available to you when you need them, okay? It's horrible. And then here, we're climbing the load, we're going up, 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 and you can see the servers are trying, okay? They're trying to follow the arrival rate, they're trying to get on, but just as we were about to get servers on, the load dropped again, and oh no, we should start shutting the servers off, okay? It's a total disaster to implement this kind of a policy, okay? It makes you understand why these companies don't like it, okay? And look at the response time. The 95% response time is horrible. 11 seconds. It was supposed to be between four and 500 seconds, okay? And it's 11 seconds. And, and you might think I could change the parameters, but we did. We spent many, many days and weeks and months trying to make this policy better. And, and we couldn't, okay? We tried to implement other people's versions, and it, it's basically got some fundamental problems. I'm late, I'm late, and I'm late, okay? It's a bad situation, okay? Now, the average power is great. The average power here is uh, 1,200 watts, that's nice, 
okay? But the response time is bad. So what is going on here, okay? Well, first we went to the literature to try to understand on-off variants. So in the literature, there is lots of work on these kinds of on-off type policies. They fall in classes called reactive. Reactive is like you look at the load, you see the load is going up, you, you, know, you react to it by provisioning for more servers. You know, if the load's going down, you react to that by provisioning for more servers, so you react, okay? Or you can see these other policies here called predictive. Predictive, you try to figure out in advance what the load is going to be. So you try to use linear regression or moving window averages. And there are a lot of good AI people at CMU who could help us with this. Okay, we're trying to understand and predict, okay, in advance what's going on. And we tried playing with these algorithms on all different kinds of traces. These were all real traces that we had to play with. And we tried playing with all the algorithms, but they just didn't work for us, okay? So they all had the following problems, okay? They all suffered from the setup lag. This lag of 260 seconds is a really big deal when you're trying to make response times of 400 milliseconds, okay? I mean, it's a big deal to have a 260 second wait, okay? And these policies were all very quick to shut servers off. They said, you know, I shouldn't have the server on, my, my load has dropped, let me shut it off. So then they shut it off, and then of course when the load went back up, the server was gone and unavailable, and so response times were terrible. Okay, the last issue, which maybe you don't realize is an issue, I didn't realize was an issue, is that they all decide their decisions of how many servers they need, the provisioning, is done based on the arrival rate, okay? So they look at the arrival rate, they say now it's 300 jobs per second, so now I need five servers. Oh, next time, next time it's 360 jobs per second, so now I need six servers, okay? And I'm gonna tell you that that's not really the right way to do things. Okay, so how are we going to do better? So I'm gonna describe what, what our thinking was more than the algorithm, okay? For what, what's, how to fix these problems. So I'm gonna explain the problems and the fixes. Okay, so the first problem. The first problem has to do with shutting servers off. All of these policies decide that, oh, servers should be shut off because the request rate has dropped so now we need fewer servers, so just shut them off, you know, and they immediately try to shut the servers off, you know, as soon as the server's empty. And basically, then when they, when they need the servers, the servers are gone. And of course, you have the setup of 260 seconds, okay? Our solution, <laughs> yes? Yes? But they say the setup time is fixed, can you try to reduce it? So the solution is twofold. The first part of the solution is don't let anybody tell you to shut the server off. It doesn't matter what the arrival rate is, do not shut the server off, okay? Just don't do it, all right? Leave the server on, okay? Wait until the server goes idle by itself, okay? Don't shut it off, be organic. This is an organic world, okay? In the organic world, we don't do anything, we just wait for nature to take its course. When the server becomes idle, then it can shut itself off. But you know what, let's wait even a little longer and then we'll let it shut off, okay? So very organic. Now this might sound very bizarre because why should the server ever shut off? I mean, each server is working on a whole bunch of requests. Why should it ever turn itself off? It's never gonna go idle, right? So what we do is we do a second part of our solution is we pack servers. So when jobs come in, Imagine the servers are lined up, like server one, two, three, four. You always try to send a maximum number of jobs to the first server while still meeting your response time SLA, okay? And then only when that's fully packed, then you try to stuff the second server full. But you always go back and try to stuff the first server again. And then you stuff the third server. And you keep the servers packed so that the servers at the bottom actually become idle. And when they become idle, you let them be organic. You let them just wait, and then they can shut themselves off when they feel like it, okay? You don't start saying, I'm gonna do capacity provisioning based on the arrival rate. You just let things do their own thing, okay? Now, turning servers on. The problem with turning servers on right now is we do it based on the arrival rate. 
And that's not a good indicator of the instantaneous situation. Suppose I told you the arrival rate is 300 jobs per second. So you tell me, well, OK, you need to have five servers, right? But really, there's this big job in the system, and he's clogged up. Well, there are a bunch of big jobs. There's a lot of variability. And some big jobs have clogged things up. And so the number of jobs in the system has been building up and up and up, OK? And you can see that there are a lot of jobs in your system. I mean, when I go to Facebook, they say, we can see the queues. We can see like how many jobs there are there, OK? So use that. Use the number of jobs in the system as your metric rather than the arrival rate. And there are ways to do this, to use the number of jobs that are currently in the system to determine how many servers you need. And that's smarter than using the arrival rate. Anyway, um, we have some theoretical results on this stuff, too, as to, as to the fact that it should work very well to do these. But let me show you the proof of the pudding. So this was the on-off that we had before. And remember how we were late, late, late? OK, we always had too few servers. This is auto-scaling, OK? Now, in auto-scaling, the first thing you notice, look at these flat lines. Everything's very smooth and calm. Why is it smooth and calm? Because we don't tell it to shut off. And we don't tell it to turn on. We don't do all these crazy things. We let it organically do what it wants to do, and it just stays smooth, OK? It's also much better at turning servers on very quickly over here because it's using the number of jobs in the system to determine that it needs to turn servers on. And the response times are within our target, and the power saved is about a factor of two. So this is in our data center. We've saved half the power. We've met the response time goals. Um, and in comparison, this was the always on that you saw before, which had twice as much power and also met the response time goals. Um, I, I will take it at the end. I'm sorry. So, okay, so this was the graph that you saw over here. This was the plot that you saw. This is another one over here which is smoother. This is from another company, their trace data. And again, the power saved is a factor of two, and the response time goals are still met. Okay? Um, and it goes <laughs> on like this. So, I want to talk a little bit about future directions. Okay? Just give me a couple minutes. So, I believe that auto scale, as much as I like it, has not solved the problem of set of times. It has only mitigated the problem. Okay? The real success in dynamic power management comes, as Ori says, we need to make the set of time smaller, or we need to make the idle time zero. If the idle time were zero, if the idle power were zero, we could use always on. And if the set of time was low, we could use on and off. Okay? So what are people doing? Well, there are these things called sleep states. Now, if you notice, the box is empty where it says sleep state, OK? And that's because I've been working with, with Intel now for several years, three or four years. And I've been asking them for sleep states, and they still don't have sleep states for servers. It seems very strange. Like, you have sleep states for your laptops. But for servers, sleep states are only just becoming, you know, coming into play right now for servers. And the reason Intel tells me that they don't have them is no company has asked them for sleep states and servers. And why have they not asked them for it? Because they want to leave their servers always on. And I've told you now, leaving the servers always on is maybe not such a good idea, OK? So sleep states are wonderful. Maybe they'll look something like this. This is what we believe we might be getting in the future. You know, 20 watts of power, 90 seconds. But it's still no free lunch, OK? It's not zero watts of power to go to sleep. And it's not like we're going to have zero setup time. We're still going to have something, OK? And so the question is, as a function of setup time and power, if you plot the on-off state over here, which uses zero watts of power but has 260 seconds of setup time, versus over here, the idle state, which uses 140 watts of power and zero seconds of setup time, all of these pink guys are contenders for, set, for sleep states. And the question we ask is which of these sleep states are going to actually be useful? Like if you run the data center and instead of turning the server off, you put it to sleep, is that going to actually be better? And the answer that I'm finding so far is maybe not. Okay? There's all sorts of complexities going on here. 
And what we use is queuing theory. Queuing theory is the ultimate for searching this space. Okay? Anybody who doesn't do queuing theory should. And I have a book coming out soon on this. And um, I'm queuing theory, and you should be doing it. Okay? So what I'm talking about is taking servers and putting them to sleep. All right? There are all sorts of questions, like when to go to sleep, which sleep state to use. There are many different sleep states. How many servers to put to sleep, okay? There are also these things called P states. People might ask me about P states. So P states are different ways of leaving your server on but using less power, okay? So you leave your server on, but you run it either at max power or at low power. Okay, these are all things you can do. Many decisions that we need to make. All right, so in conclusion, in the 1990s, you had these things called load balancers. And for those of you who were around then, I was, we always worried about how to balance load among the servers. That's all we wanted to do. Today, I think the world is changing. We don't have a load balancer. We have what I call a power aware load balancer. So uh, the load balancer has to worry not about how to balance the load, I mean, that's part of it, but also how to turn servers on and off or put them into sleep or put them into different P states or who knows what. And these are the decisions that we need to make. Leaving the servers always on, which is what people do, is not going to cut it. This is not going to work in the future, okay? But provisioning for the correct number of servers when you don't know the load is really hard. Okay? Like I said, simple ideas like, oh, well, we'll just turn the servers off don't work very well. Okay? So you need to do it in the right way. Um, a lot more potential will be available once we have sleep states, S states, C states, different P states. A lot of different things are going to be available to us, and we're going to have to play with them and try to understand them both theoretically and in practice. And um, of course, queuing theory is what you need to understand this space. Thank you, thanks for having me.